from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 363, recorded live Thursday, March 14th, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklin's.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Paul Irish about HTML5, JavaScript, Chrome, and the web platform. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and today we've got Paul Irish. How are you, sir? Hello. Doing good. Doing great. Very cool. Thanks for um, for coming on to talk to me. Um, so you work in at, at Google. You are Chrome Developer Relations? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Developer Advocate uh, on Chrome. Um, I'm all about, uh, these days, I'm all about kind of developer productivity, making sure that developers are as productive as they can be when building, you know, web apps that are amazing on desktop, on mobile. Um, and, and also, you know, people develop with best practices that are performant, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I love that word advocate. I think that you and I kind of have similar jobs, but we also work for these giant companies where people assume that we have to represent all of the company's interests. So it's like, oh, you work for Google. You must care really deeply about ads. But, <laughs> you know, but from watching you, you care yeah. about the web. Yeah. And people like it. think I care about Xbox or whatever, you know, sure. or I got, I got yelled at recently for not having a Windows phone. And it's like, you know, kind of not my thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. My, my, I mean, my passion is, is I want the web to win. I, I'm, I'm really passionate about it as an application platform. Um, and I think that there's, there's still a lot we can do, but I'm excited about the state that it is right now. And so that's my focus. And it's not, it's not a Google like point of view per se. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of things that Google does that could be even better when it comes to, uh, um, towards the web and its promise. So. Um, I'm very happy to be honest about those kinds of things. Do you feel like you're kind of in a pretty sweet situation in the sense of like you've got this big company behind you that lets you push the web forward, kind of regardless of whether it helps Google or not? Like the web will win. The web is winning. The avalanche has begun. It's yeah. Too, you know, it's well, it's really fantastic to be somewhere where, you know, I can have the sort of uh, reach and impact that I think uh, that I think really benefits uh, the situation. So. Um, that's why when like a startup is like, Hey Paul, you want to go lead a front end engineering team? And I'm like, well, you know, I do partly want to, you know, just go hack hundred percent on web stuff, but also I, I think we're not done yet from it, from like a web advocacy standpoint. So I think it's great to be here. Yeah. I think just when I think we are even close to done, I'm like, no, we're, we've been at like, <laughs> we've been at like 49% for like the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. The progress bar is not moving. Yeah. Um, although Chrome definitely changed, tra- changed the speed of the progress bar when, it, when it came out. I mean, I just opened up Chrome, uh, beta. I think I'm on the beta channel. I was on Canary for a while. Anyway, I just noticed literally this morning, I'm on Chrome 27 and I swear it was 17. Re- <laughs> I mean, really recently, which brings up this idea of, I guess you don't really think about version numbers anymore. It really is all about feature detection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the Chrome way is, is, especially when it comes to users is there are no version numbers. Chrome just updates. Um, you, you now know, you now have a new feature. Um, and that's the way that we talk about it to users. To developers, we do have to be a bit more specific. And that's why sites like Can I Use are really helpful when it comes down to tracking when Web Audio API, when WebGL, et cetera, all landed in what Chrome version. But, mm-hmm. uh, but of course, yeah, inevitably feature detection, um, is, is the right way to be handling, handling this in, in Chrome and in all the very, all the various mobile devices that actually are sometimes a bit trickier when it comes to this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I get the impression, and I don't work for IE, nor do I know anyone over there. So this is just me as web guy observing this, that they seem to believe that things might be a little more slower. They're like, it's, you know how like some people are on Canary, some people are on beta, some people are on stable. Yeah. How often does Chrome stable rev? Uh, about every, uh, 12 weeks. Okay. So people think that Chrome is updating like every three or four hours, but in realistically, <laughs> it's like three or four times a year, right? It's kind of like half the speed of Ubuntu, right? It's like oh, sorry, Ubuntu is very reliable. Six, and six weeks is fine. Six weeks is, is stable. 
Six weeks is stable? Okay. So so if IE starts doing it every year or every 18 months or something like that, as people on the web are presuming, um, the argument is always made that, oh, enterprises can't go that fast. Like, you know, they they, they all need IE6 still. Do enterprises use Chrome? And does does it revving so fast freak out their IT departments? Um. I don't, I don't know what, what sort of, what the, the enterprise situation is for Chrome. Like, I, I do know that when Firefox announced that they had a, a new release model, um, uh, the enterprise community kind of was really upset. Um, and that led Firefox to introducing the ESR, the extended support release, mm-hmm. which I think is fi- equal to Firefox 10 and it supported for a year. Um, and so that was their way of, whereas the rest of Firefox ships every six weeks, just like Chrome. Mm. Um, Chrome has supports for being able to turn off automatic updates as mm-hmm. much as I hate that idea. Um, <laughs> there is support. There's, you know, MSI installer and, and administrators can turn off updates. Uh, but I would be very unhappy if I met someone <laughs> that, that did that. Um, mm. like, you know, the, the consumer side web, uh, deals with deals with the moving the the rapidly changing landscape of browsers and it deals with new uh, browser versions and it feature detects and all those things and i like i'm just i i think that the enter the internet side of the uh internet internet side web apps are just there was there was a time when people didn't know how to develop them very well and that's why they got locked into it only works in this browser version um but i think that's changing a lot um, especially, especially with the, the changes that IE has made, you know, comparing IE, uh, six to IE nine, um, it's a completely different browser. And, you know, anyone developing for the IE nine browser is not going to have a problem when IE 10 comes down, um, in their company. So we're in a bit of a different landscape. So I, I think that the concerns of, of the web app doesn't work anymore are, are mostly behind us. Yeah. I think that there's, it's all just FUD, right? It's just fear that, you know, the expense reporting system we wrote 12 years ago is going to suddenly, suddenly break and we don't know where that code is anymore. Like it sounds silly, sure. but like that's a classic problem for an enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So if, if WebKit is making a move and we've still got Firefox, but now Opera has announced that they're going to go WebKit, uh, presumably in a fairly orderly fashion. I'm starting to see all these kind of uh, blog posts around what they call WebKit monoculture. So WebKit, some people say it, it moves the web forward, which I think we can all agree it kind of did. Sure. But at the same time, people are saying, well, maybe WebKit will hold us back because then they'll only be WebKit. Right. I I think um, I think on desktop, this doesn't matter. On desktop, this this change, uh, especially from Opera, doesn't seem to have as big of an impact. But on mobile, I think that's that's probably what precipitated a lot of it. Um, it's very hard, I imagine, for for Firefox, for IE, and previously for Opera to get compatibility on the mobile web um, because uh, WebKit has had an early lead there um, and. Bad web de- <laughs> web developers using bad practices have. Um, you mean t- web developers <laughs> targeting mobile Safari? Yeah, yeah, and, and they've 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 targeted um, that side of, that flavor of the, of the web platform, um, and and that in men- in some cases has not been interoperable. Maybe they're missing vendor prefixes. Maybe they're using things um, that are only available in the iOS WebKit, um, but. It led to an issue where there's there's a bad compatibility thing. Mozilla actually did a a study and found like they they basically went through a top ten thousand sites and looked at the vendor prefixes that they used, and uh like let's say for every site that used uh, WebKit dash transition, about fifteen percent of those sites also had MS dash MS dash transition. Mm-hmm. So, um and and probably. Um, a, a, just a few bit more would have the unprefix transition, which is what, uh, IE10 actually uses. So there was a big problem for, you know, that the authoring side didn't really expect a widely diverse browser engine mobile web. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the web developer's fault. So Opera made this move. Um, and I mean, it's, it's going to be good for their users. Um, 
a lot of the concern, I think, in the WebKit monoculture, in the, the WebKit monoculture conversation is that when WebKit has some uh, quirk that is unique to WebKit and that is not either in the spec or is not shared by other browsers, then that just becomes kind of the way that everyone expects things to work. And so bugs will be fire, filed against other browser vendors saying, why don't you treat border radius with elliptical shapes like this or something? Mm -hmm. um, because WebKit does it. So uh, so I can understand why, why basically, you know, specs need to trump WebKit's behavior. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of ways to resolve this, um, right now that the testing infrastructure between all the, all the browsers, it could be better. Um, all the, all the browsers have really great tests that they run against, but they're not shared and they're not executed across the vendors as much as they should be. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are fairly interoperable implementations of the same features, but we could do better there. Um, yeah. So that's that's one of the things that I've been talking about internally inside the Chrome team, but also having, we had a, a W3C testing workshop recently around, you know, making this uh, setup a lot better where where all the browsers are, are kind of uh, having congruent um, feature implementations. Mm -hmm. Why don't specs more Trump I mean, uh, Trump implementations. But I can understand where if there was only one browser and it was only WebKit and then the web, it would be the one that implemented the spec and then that would be the spec. It would become the de facto spec. I get why people would be concerned about that. But why do these things even go, go wrong? I mean, if you look on Stack Overflow, almost every question on the web now is these three browsers do it the way we think the spec works and this one interpreted it differently. Yeah. There was some, I forgot what it was, there was some hover pseudo element thing in IE 10 or whatever. And it's like, everybody does it this way, except they read it that way. Don't they all get in a room and chat about this? How does that even happen? <laughs> they do. Yeah. I, so a lot, so there's a lot of conversations around what behavior should be. And that gets into the spec. Um, so you, you look, you look at like any mailing list, like a uh, WWW style. Um, and if you let that into your inbox, you'll be drowned really quickly. But there's a lot of really healthy conversations across browser vendors on what the behavior should be and all these edge cases. It's really fantastic to watch. I think though, at the same time, while there's a debate like that, there is, there's a shortage of, of people who are writing specs and especially people who are authoring test suites, um, especially early on in spec development. So what that means is that vendors, uh, browsers will then be implementing something and they'll be writing their own tests, but it won't be shared across, um, things. So it's like this minor logistical issue that actually, um, is being changed. There's a lot of the proposals that have come out of Adobe, things like, uh, some web components things. Those are starting out very early on with cross vendor, um, test suites. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, um, I think like CSS transforms, uh, did not really have that sort of coverage uh, early on. So some of the implementations got a touch different. Do you think that this time next year, we're going to start to defragment all of this and get our heads on straight? Or are we going to continue to jockey for position like this? Yeah, I, yeah. there's a lot of really good things happening in the space right now. Um, W3C actually just added someone full-time. Uh, his name is Toby Langell. He was the, uh, he's the kind of W3C honcho at Facebook. And he is now full-time for one year um, trying to fix the, the testing infrastructure um, so that all vendors are tested across the same stuff um, and that it's painless for, for them to maintain that. So actually... Like I'm being kind of um, cranky about the situation right now, but I see a lot. I have a lot of optimism for how it's going in the right direction. I wonder what that must feel like. I mean, not to like overstate Tony's uh, position, but it's like we have one guy for one year to fix this thing that could change <laughs> the face of the web forever. <laughs> I mean, doesn't it seem like somebody might want to just throw in some money to help out and put a couple people on this full time and get some things done? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and so all, all browser vendors have, have people that, that focus, um, uh, exclusively on testing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but then there's kind of a, a connection point that needs to be improved regarding browser zone testing and then testing at the, at the standards and the shared level. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, we're going to see more investment there, I expect. Um, and should just kind of make everything a lot better. 
I think a lot of people who are making the move, a lot of enterprise developers that are making the move from kind of server side development where they really work their backend servers to make HTML and ship angle brackets across the wire are now moving into a, a balance where there's some work that happens on the server and there's a lot of work that happens on the client. Mm. They find this world where we're all jockeying for position. There's a lot of personality driven development. Yeah. You're not using required JS. You suck. Oh, you're not using this. You suck. You know, you, you, it's almost like you, with Twitter, the idea of followers, you pick your favorite JavaScript developer or you pick your favorite company and then you want to use their stuff. It all started with the whole jQuery, MooTools, MochiKit, yeah. kind of like sl- and SmackDown. Then one of them won. And now we're fighting about MVC frameworks. Right, right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think there, there's something about uh, the web community that really just prizes um, just like celebrity, whether it's, whether it's a project or a person. Um, and it really is all about, I mean, part of it's nice because part of it's about like a strong and loyal community and and a community that you like have camaraderie with and you learn from. But then the evil side is that sometimes it's just not, uh, you know, not pushing us in the right direction. Um, I think I got some feedback on one of my projects a while ago that was along these lines because I think somewhere around when, when HTML5 boilerplate launched, the, the copy on the homepage was, was very like, mm-hmm. uh, it was very showy and it was very like, this stuff will just make you look cool. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I, I wrote it in a way that I was so excited about it and I was just, you know, excited to share it, but it wasn't, it wasn't explaining what this does for you and, and right. how it, it was more just like getting you excited. Do you and think that that's a, in a youthful exuberance or I mean like cause there there are people who will come out with some pick a noun dot js and then they'll right. go and they'll make a gorgeous site and it'll be like such and such such and such and go, boom right like all caps like boom that's our tagline boom yeah you know what yeah. I mean and so yeah <laughs> the it's um it's okay to be excited though I mean yeah no it's exci- it's okay I one of the things that I it's been really uh, enlightening to see the Flex developer community kind of entering into JavaScript and HTML5 mm-hmm. um, because they've come from a completely different background. They're used to a platform that offers a lot of things that they kind of have to put together on their own. And they come and they see these projects and they're just like, why are these projects marketing themselves so hard at you? Why aren't they just telling me bullet by bullet the feature set that they offer? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I I understand. Like, you know, part of it is is... The web community doesn't have the vocabulary established that people like the Flex community had. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other part is that um, I, I agree that that things could be a little bit more uh, just plain um, and readable when it comes to what exactly you're getting out of this project mm-hmm. um, and how you're going to want to partner your use of this of this tool or project with other things. Yeah, I think that that for it feels like that there's small companies, small startups, five, ten people in a room, really excited, full of energy and caffeine, head in one direction. And then there's kind of this tired, more enterprisey developers just like, just sit, just solve this problem for yeah. me, do it in a reliable way, don't disappear. Yep. So there's like, there's a pragmatism aspect of things, it's almost like there's a triangle, there's pragmatism, there's showy and flashy, and then there's purist. Kind of like the is this code uh, haiku <laughs> quality, right? Right. And and there's this constant balance between like take any library and you could plot it on this this triangle as far as like is is it flashy? Is it showy? Is it trying to like be lisp like or is it trying to be like coffee script where it's gorgeous and it's look what we did in twelve lines of code? Or is it yeah. all where there's no library? It's just really a gorgeous front end and there's nothing. Uh, there's no <laughs> there. Right. Yeah. It seems like you'd want. I mean. When you plot it out like that in that triangle, like I, I feel like I want something that's kind of in the middle. You know, I want something that is eloquently written, mm-hmm. um, and I want it to, I want it to sell itself well enough that I know that there's going to be a community that's around it and can support it, and I can learn from. Yeah. But I also want to know that its engineering principles are 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 good, and that the problem that it's trying to solve is is large enough for me to you know to sink some time into learning it. Exactly. I think I'm looking here online. I think I thought there was a project that just came out. 
I want to say it was called like Low Bar or Slow Mo Jazz. No. Oh, shoot. Um, what was her name? Oh, I'll find it. But there was a project that just came out that was like trying to be like underscore, but it was an underscore competitor. Oh, uh, Low Dash. Dash. Low Dash. Low Dash. Yeah, Low Dash, uh, written by John David Dalton. He's actually he's a JavaScript performance manager at, at Microsoft. Um, but this is uh, his open source project. And yeah, so he came out with this. Um, uh, originally, it, it started as a fork of underscore because John tried to get some changes into underscore that that the community didn't uh didn't allow in mm-hmm. he created a fork he's now been allowed back onto the project as a uh, contributor and collaborator mm-hmm. um and so he's contributing to both his fork and alternative and the original project which is right. an interesting situation but it's also like the lodash community while originally it was kind of like this outcast and like Everyone's like, well, how, I don't know if I can trust this. Now it's it's actually a very well like uh, celebrated and and shared kind of project. Exactly, and I I bring that up as an example where uh, Kit Cambridge's article that said mm. say hello to Lodash was presented in a way that was practical, pragmatic, yeah. flashy, side by side demos, but extremely like, all right, here's what we have to offer. So I, I look at that as like. In my mind, the one that I've thought of in the last few months, that's right in the middle of that triangle. Yeah, yeah. It's a really solid project. They've done a great job there. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, at a lower level, I feel like we're reinventing a lot of work and like, all right, I'm going to make the world's great to-do application. First, I need to decide how I'm going to manage async. First, I'm going to decide how I do module loading. Sure. Um, it seems like we're in a very scary time of flux right now. Like if I was going to do a startup and do a lot of JavaScript today, I might find half of my project being thrown out when ES six comes out next year or whenever things happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's there's a lot of things going on right now. Like another part is like I want to build a web app. Um, there's a lot of parts that are going to like the best way to build a large app is to never build a large app and to build a collection of small you know small modules things that mm-hmm. work together. Um, how am I adding that into my page? Like twenty five script tags? Probably not. Like I should be using modules these days, you know, people go the route of, of authoring in AMD modules or they will use common JS modules and use something like no browser fi mm-hmm. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. But I think that like nowadays it's pretty much impossible to um, be authoring something of significance and not be authoring your code in modules. Um, so I'm excited about what ECMAScript six does because modules are, are, Right now, kind of, we have these hacks to make this work, protect the global scope and things like that. ECMAScript 6 offers a real native way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there's a lot of other pieces coming around this. One is, um, when it comes to like building an app, uh, I'm going to have my application code. I'm going to split it up, but I'm also going to have dependencies on third party code. And right now, like, let's say I want to use Backbone. Um, okay. So I open my browser and I, Google Backbone, I, I download it, I move it from my downloads folder into my application folder, I and I add it into my page somehow. When I want to update it, I go through a similar thing. Like, I'm watching Twitter to find out when it updates, and then I go, like, this. these manual steps... Um, oh, I didn't even mention the fact that it has dependencies of its own that I need to go find on the web, too. Like, uh, I feel that we're at this point where we... that package management could really solve a lot of problems for us, um, mm-hmm. make us more productive, um, keep our libraries up to date, um, help us out a lot with that. And isn't so, there a lot of, isn't it multifaceted though? I mean, there's package, there's bringing it down, there's yeah. putting it somewhere. Yeah. There's ma- version management, dependency management, like you mentioned. There's like the, the RPM, NPM, NuGet, gems side of things, development right. time. Right. Then there's runtime loading and management yep. of that, but then bundling and minification. And then there's, yeah, the optimization side on that side. Yeah, so a, a good solution has to kind of handle all these things. Um, and, and a few people have tried different approaches. Um, there, there was a project uh, a bit ago um, called BPM, uh, Browser Package Manager, mm-hmm. and it kind of ch- tried to tackle uh, all three pieces. So it not only tracked the retrieving of packages, but also had our, its own preview server and then handled minification uh, itself as well. New other projects nowadays. Um, I'm involved in a project called Bower that was originally started by Twitter, but 
now is a very kind of large development open source community that's supporting it. Um, and it is, is pretty much only just there, there is a registry and there's a way to pull things down from it, resolve the dependencies, get those, and then keep things up to date. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's hooks to, to connect to these other parts of, of runtime module loading, um, and the build time optimization. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm really, really, I, I think that without basically without adopting package management solutions, we're kind of holding ourselves like holding ourselves back. Mm-hmm. I, I see kind of people re- remaining at the same level of, of the web platform. They're just only building so high. People get afraid of, of having dependencies of using third party code. Um, and I think it's really holding back the sophistication of what we can actually develop on the web platform. Mm-hmm. So I think the, I'm, I'm just really excited to, to see more adoption, more tooling around, um, things, you know, I, I don't want to have to manage my, my NuGet and my NPM and my, my other client side package management all uniquely if I don't have to. And I think there's some, port, some, uh, opportunities for, for integrations, um, but also plenty of other development. So I'm pretty active in the development, the developer community there and invite anyone else to join us. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I struggled with a lot yesterday, uh, that I guess Flexbox will fix at some point. I was messing with some CSS and I had three browsers open on three monitors and I was doing a bunch of breakpoint responsive stuff and I was chasing boxes around. I basically had a grid of boxes and I wanted them to resize appropriately and I was deciding whether I wanted to go and use, um, uh, what is the, what is the one that's with the name of bricks? Um, it's the, it's the re- automatic resizing uh, masonry. Masonry, yeah. So I was thinking, well, maybe it's time to just rip this whole design out and do masonry. And I open up Chrome Tools, yeah. and I get the CSS perfect. Yeah. And then I bumped something, and it was <laughs> back the way it was again, and I'd lost everything. I and I know. said to myself, well, how come I'm not typing in here and having it automatically go back? So I look around on the web, and there's a half dozen different projects out there where they're trying to close that browser tools loop to to, yeah. to say – I'm in a mode now where I've modified my CSS. I want to push it back to the server now. That hmm. should be a, that should be a spec. You see what I'm saying? Like every browser should support that. Yeah. Um, there's a few ways, uh, at least in the, the Chrome DevTools, to, to tackle that. One is Command Z works these days. That would just add- undo my safe to gl- self to glory. I think I reloaded yeah. the page or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was added not too not too long ago, but it's kind of a secret and I probably undocumented feature. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Um, uh, one of the other, yeah, um, inside Chrome DevTools, we've done a lot of things to create that kind of authoring experience where you can just basically develop inside the Chrome DevTools and not even head back to your, your editor, or your IDE. Mm-hmm. Uh, Remy Sharp has a great screencast on this. Um, and, uh, but you can basically, one of the cool, great things that actually just finished landing, um, so let's say you're developing your CSS with SAS. Um, there's support for SAS source maps. So mm. I can author in SAS, um, I can compile it, it comes out in CSS. I see the, 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 the styles of my DOM as regular, but then I can control click back to my original SAS while, while being in the Chrome DevTools, make changes right there inside the DevTools, hit save, um, and then my styles will auto refresh with the new compiled, uh, styles. So like, that's a really cool workflow um, that you don't even have to leave the dev tools for. And so we're wow. seeing a lot of improvements there and just kind of like, let's take the workflow that you're doing with all these tools kind of separated and just deliver it to all of you in one place. Is the Chrome dev tools then opening the file off disk or is there a listener that I have to implement in my server? Uh, it is uh, the, comp- the compilation step is up to you. Um, but uh, when the compiled file changes, the Chrome DevTools picks that up on its own. Very cool. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I want to talk to, kind of like one of the last things I wanted to talk to about, is that there it's it's clear that a lot of front end development uh, is 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 Mac focused and Node focused, and mm. and npm is becoming like the package manager for everything, and yeah. things like Bower and Yeoman and all those things are are all focused at the command line. And the Windows guys are really struggling. If I wanted to get Yeoman running on Windows, it's just going to always be a struggle. Mm. What can, you know, should should Microsoft kind of try to help out and make things like Yeoman and Bauer and these different things like easier to use for Windows developers? 
Like, uh, I, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. like, like Azure, for example, we have the Azure tools in NPM. So you just go NPM install Azure and then you go and rock it at the command line. It's cool. Yeah. But trying to get something like Yeoman working or auto reload, it's always like for Linux, for Mac and Windows and beta. Mm, you know, we're trying to figure out how do you need Sigwin or not? I mean, ultimately, are yeah. we being held back by the fact that we don't just have bash? Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, the answer to the last question is probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, every time, <laughs> uh, I, hey man, I it's wanna, an honest question. I'm trying yeah, to, I mean, there's a I mean, lot of Windows developers out there that want to be on the cutting edge. Yeah. But, I mean, I want to type ls and have it work. Uh, and not dirt. Well, it, uh, it does work in PowerShell, but yes, you're absolutely Okay. Right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I did a survey, um, not too long ago about what, um, of the Chrome developer tools audience, what OS is everyone is on. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, forty forty twenty win Mac Linux. Really? Um, yeah. Which wow. I, w- I I was surprised by how how high Linux was, so I went and double checked, and yeah. So I those still numbers, find that hard to believe. That's pretty crazy. It, yeah, it's really high, but um, but that makes me like make sure that Linux uh priority is a, is, a, is a big uh Linux support is a big priority. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's for for Windows priority or Windows. Uh, support for dev tools. Like, I think it's mostly just the history there, which is that Windows has always offered kind of GUI developer tools, whereas on Mac and Linux, it's been more command line focused. Um, and, and I, I don't know what Windows develop, what developers using Windows prefer. Um, but certainly from a, from a tooling standpoint, it's much easier to support command line tools on Windows than it is to have to build a GUI around it. Mm. Um, as long as you're okay with that, that being your audience, someone who's comfortable on the command line. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're finding that, um, like in ASP.net, for example, uh, it's about, I would probably say like 60, 40 or 70, 30, where we really like the GUI. Um, but they want a command line usually in Visual Studio. So for example, in VS, mm. there's a, there's a package console, just like uh, in Sublime. You know, you could kind of bring up the Quake console and do your thing and then throw it away. We, we use, you know, the NuGet package manager has PowerShell inside VS. Mm. And inevitably what happens is we'll convert stuff from Bash to PowerShell and then wish we had Bash in, <laughs> in Visual Studio. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want to go into Visual Studio, go and yeah. say NPM install, Bower, or add Yeoman, and then... Totally. Go back into VS, but I haven't really left. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like VS as Emacs. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> no, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, I want to, I want it paneled, right? I live in VS. Yeah. I like things about VS, but I want to have a, a command line that's docked. Right. And, and move smoothly between the two. And trying to figure out, like, and I use, I just use Yeoman as the example because Yeoman is one of those things that brings in a bunch of other tools. And, yeah. You know, I don't know whether Yeoman will win the web, but that's just an example of, a perspective that right. I can't even offer, like without busting out my MacBook, I can't even offer ideas on what I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. On Yeoman, uh, uh, we, uh, the, when we just went out under, underwent a really big refactor and kind of changed the entire way that it works. Uh, Thereby on, breaking it on Windows. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> the beta does not currently work on Windows. So, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, there used to be a yeoman command on the command line and there's, that is now dead and deceased. Um, mm-hmm. so big change in kind of how everything operates. Um, and, but the 1.0 final, which we expect to ship in the next few weeks, um, will have Windows support. I think that For NPM sure. and Node and JavaScript executables may be the, the answer, isn't it? Uh, I, I'd be, I'd be pretty happy with that. Like, you know, maybe I can't go and go all said and awk my way to glory, but if yeah, I can yeah. type yo this and yo that, and it's just it's just a node app, right. that'd be yeah. great. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 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 environment of of npm being so um, uh, running so well on Windows these days, I think, was a really big boost for both sides. Um, and so I I really like seeing kind of the the tool ecosystem. Um, written in Node, kind of taking off. Um, it's not just for for modules that can, that, you know, are used in the in an app, but are now the build tools that you're using to construct those apps. So I'm really excited about that move. Yeah, definitely. 
cool. Well, thanks so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great. Awesome. All right. Well, Paul Irish, you can check him out. You Google for Paul Irish and you'll find all sorts of great stuff. YouTube channel and his, and his blog and HTML5 boilerplate. Uh, this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.